Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the C Squared podcast. We have another daily recap today for you. It's the second day of the World Championship match between Yane Pomniashi and Ding Li Ren. Yane Pomniashi with the black pieces. Ding Li Ren trying to put some pressure early on with the white pieces. It is the first time in the match that Ding has the white pieces. And I have to say he came up with some very, very intriguing ideas. We will get into that in just a second. Fabi, first of all, good morning. You just woke up. You just analyze the game how is it looking yeah i woke up and the game was over it, it seemed to have ended rather quickly and i i had a look at it um let's but, not spoil yeah. it let's not spoil it because we got some some flack in the comments that we spoiled uh, the match result in the first 40 seconds of the last video so let's get straight into the analysis fabi sure so ding started with the first move d4 we kind of expected that that's his mainstay for most of his life. Mm -hmm. He's been playing D4. Jan played knight of 6, c4, e6. No surprises there. Uh, here, Ding could have played Nimzo with knight c3. He played knight f3 instead, which is also his main line. He's been playing this during the candidates, for example. Uh, Jan played d5. No surprises there at, at all. And That's this is, what Jan this is something we discussed before. yesterday, right? And you predicted the move knight to c3, I think, at this point. I, I said that it would either probably be knight c3 or g3 here. g3 is a catalan. Knight c3 is... There's no name really for knight c3, I guess, but it does open up a huge amount of possibilities for black. For example, after knight c3, bishop to b4 is called the Ragozin defense. Mm -hmm. uh, bishop to e7 is, I guess, commonly referred to as a queen's game. It declined, but can lead to all sorts of other names, uh, depending on if white, if white plays bishop f4 or bishop g5. And this is... c6 is a semi, semi-slav defense. Yeah, and uh, bishop e7 was a very hotly contested uh, option in your match in 20. Yeah, I played bishop e7 against Magnus in 2018. Bishop b4 I've been playing a lot recently. The main problem I assumed that Ding wanted to avoid was the fourth move c5. And then after c5, white usually plays c takes d5. And then black c comes up with this more modern approach, c takes d4. Queen takes d4, e takes d5. And Jan has played this recently. It's also a favored weapon of uh, Wesley So, for example. Magnus Carlsen has played it, of course. Anish Giri. Basically, every Ding himself, every player, every top player under the sun, except for me, I, I haven't played it. This um, is also has... almost impossible to find some advantage. The best white can get is something along the lines of e4, knight c6, bishop to b5, and get into this endgame in which, um, yeah, this is considered to be more or less equal if black knows how the, to The endgame is considered equal. Play. So usually people play 7th move bishop g5, trying to get some sort of isolate. Uh, for example, Magnus beat Anish here. Uh, Anish recently tried it as well, With the and, and so on. So, yeah, Carlson beat him in, in uh, Norway chess. Um, Carlson also played this against uh, against Jan. Um, but it is objectively equal if you know it well, if you prepare it well. It's pretty much impregnable. Yeah. So, so the way that White can try to avoid this is either the Catalan, With uh, G3. as, as Mag Magnus played fourth move G three. Magnus played in the previous match. Magnus against Jan, mm -hmm. or there is this funny option C takes D five. I've played this myself to avoid basically everything. C D five, E D five, and Knight C three, and you kind of avoid everything. This is actually famous of Magnus. Yeah. Um, I think this is how is this how Magnus beat Jan in the last Singfield Cup before? Like, yes. Or yes, he lost yes. the he, whole he, drawing. He played the idea with uh, Bishop F four, E three, H three, G four. I think. Yeah, I've played this a lot too. Like I, I played it against um, against Fedor Save in the World Rapid. I played it against Karyakin. So I also play this quite a bit myself. But instead, Ding came up with a very unusual move, which I have never analyzed before. Fourth move, h3. This, and we have to say it's probably Richie Reports doing. He comes up with this type of like uncompromising approaches. Um, how would you assess this move, h3, and try to? pretty much explain the plans of this move behind so this move. yeah i won't uh say i know much about this move it does have a feeling of richie to it it does feel like something he could have come up with the main idea is simply if black plays c5 on the fourth move and white plays c takes d5 now c takes d4 looks a little bit silly although the computer still says you can play cd4 but that's a pawn sacrifice so yeah. black plays ed5 and we have a standard kind of um tarish position where black will very likely end up with an isolated pawn on d5. But white has spent that, instead of on the move knight c3, white has played the move h3. So it's basically like white sacrificed half a tempo. And to my eye, and also to the computers, black is doing extremely well here. But the computer does say, after cd5, ed5, you can play g3. And 
it's some sort of position. I don't know uh, what White's chances of gaining an advantage are here. It's probably, if Black knows it well, pretty pretty much zero, I guess. And if Black doesn't know it well, maybe you have some chances to get an advantage. You know, it might... It does make some sense, right? Because you very often see, especially in the Tarash, the light square bishop for black landing on g4, right? Putting some pressure on the knight on f3 and the pawn on e2 if we see the exchange uh, c takes d4, knight takes d4. So this move h3 maybe makes some sense down the road. I guess this is yeah, probably it, it what could, Dim's plan was. It could be a decent semi-helpful move, h3. On the other hand... The Tarish itself is considered, like, if instead of h3, black, white has the move, knight c3, it's also considered completely dead equal. Yes. So <laughs> I played it recently against Levon Aronian. So I, I really don't think h3 is a very threatening move. Like, if I'd, I had prepared the Tarish, mm -hmm. and instead of the move, knight c3, at some point my opponent plays h3, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to be super terrified over the board. I'm going to think, okay, I'm, I'm equal. Like, mm -hmm. this is an equal position. But still, we do have to play a game. Chess remains complicated, even if, even if you make some sort of half move. Uh, which isn't super threatening. Other good moves for black on move four, for example, c6 is an excellent move. It's basically c6 is a semi slav. Yes. Very you play, didn't play knight c3. So play probably should, white yeah. played like e3, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, black is doing fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so h3 is sort of a move just to avoid one thing, just to avoid specifically c5, cd5, cd4. Um, that's it. That's the whole idea behind it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And Jan took some time, tried to kind of remember his ideas. I'm sure he briefly probably looked at this move H3. You kind of look at pretty much every single move in, in, in the first few moves of chess uh, when you prepare for a world I actually wouldn't match. be surprised if he hasn't seen the move. You don't think so, huh? You, you, the move looks so silly. You, you think it's that I mean, silly? Yeah, it's and it's, it's only been played like no strong... Well, okay, I shouldn't say no strong player. But no top player has ever played it, and the strongest players who have played it, uh, Nikita Meshkovs. Okay, uh, that, that's a, a 2600 uh, Grandmaster. Okay, played it, it in a titled Tuesday. <laughs> and a player who I haven't hey, heard hey, before. Hey, 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 Title Tuesday are the benchmark of elite level games nowadays. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> and then there's another player, Gatino, who's 2400, who played it in a title Tuesday. And after that, Nobody above the rating 2,000 has played this move, which to me is absolutely shocking. I can't believe that. Like, every move has been played except for this one. This seems to be the rarest move. In chess. Like, it's, it's very surprising because <laughs> it's not like a completely stupid move, but it's super, super rare. It might be the rarest fourth move in, at least in this position, right? And perhaps yeah, and, outside of the and, topical main lines, perhaps this is the rarest for fourth move in in chess. It, it's super, super rare. So h3, um, Jan, Jan played d takes c4. e3. Mm -hmm. Which c4. is basically, dc4 is we're trying to get into a queen's gambit accepted where white has played the move h3, which you don't really see the move h3 in a queen's gambit accepted. Yeah. So e3, um, c5. you can't say h3 is a very helpful move for white. Yes. c5, bishop c4, a6. I think Jan's opening approach from that sense is very logical because he knows that he can't, he can't really be objectively worse if he plays this way. Yeah. A6, castle, knight, c6. Castle, knight, c6. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have other moves like v5 is for sure a decent move instead of knight, c6, but you can't say knight, c6 is a, uh, is a bad accuracy. move. It's, it's yeah. actually the first line of the computer. Although, mm -hmm. computer basically says a bunch of moves are more or less equivalent. Yeah. Knight, c6, yeah. knight to c3. Ding also had the choice to play very safe with d takes c5 and go for an endgame. Typical, typical sort of endgame, but for sure... Black is not really worse, although white has no reason to to be worried either. It's more or less an equal to slightly, slightly better endgame for white. But once again, you deal with those type of um, thoughts. You just played h3 and you know that you can get this type of endgame with a knight on c3 or perhaps a more useful move. Even b3, right, is more useful because you're getting ready to get the bishop on the long diagonal. So h3... Oh, b3 is E3 is one of the main lines of the Queen's Gambit. Exactly. Not here, but exactly. in general, it's one of the main lines of the Queen's Gambit accepted. It just doesn't make a lot of sense that you're going to get a better endgame with the move H3 on the board. I have a feeling that Ding had analyzed a little something of this line, because Knight C3 is a, an aggressive approach, and if you know nothing, then maybe DC5 is a bit more natural. But Knight C3 is a super aggressive move. The Knight on C3 could be a bad piece. It's kind of known in these structures that if Black plays B5, 
uh, or if in some cases white plays a3, b4, either knight on c6 or knight on c3 can be rather misplaced compared to on d7 because it blocks the diagonal of the bishop. Like, mm -hmm. let's say b5, mm -hmm. um, bishop d3, bishop b7 was played. The knight on c6 would be better on d7. It blocks the bishop's diagonal on c6. Yes. So bishop b7, Ding played a4. And I actually think that he had this position from a very similar looking position with the work on e1 and pawn on h2 from the Queen's Gambit accepted against Aronian. Yes. And 2021 match in the chessball uh, Masters, I think. Which is also a very rare line of the Queen's Gambit accepted, but. Um, and I've been looking at things similarly to that recently because I played Wesley so recently in a match, and Wesley so plays the Queen's Gambit accepted. So I was looking for some kind of small tries in the Queen's Gambit accepted yes. involving the, the knight on c3, the placement of the knight on c3. Mm -hmm. uh, so. So that is a slightly better version for it. The rook on e1 is a bit more useful than the pawn on h3. The pawn on h3 doesn't really have any specific use in this position. It's just kind of you'd rather have it there than on h2. Just but it doesn't really give some space, right, later on. Yeah, to stop knight g4 and some like long, uh, long off variations that we we can't really foresee yet. Sometimes yes. e45 comes and the knight goes to g4. We can talk about the lift of the king, but obviously. You know, black is not printing the back right checkmate anytime soon. Yeah. So, uh, Jan played a. Uh, sorry, Ding played a four. Mm hmm. A four, uh, b four, knight d four, and knight to a five. A five. A uh, very good move. Knight to a five. And I think otherwise this is the maybe white is getting the slight edge if not for this move. Yes, and I think this is the critical position and the, the game that you were mentioning between Ding and Aronian. And by the way, this is the first time that Ding spent a significant amount of time on his move. Describe to us this moment, his options, which are probably knight takes f6 and knight takes c5, what the difference between them is, and did Ding make the right decision? Yeah, I think that it's probably a decision that Ding will not be super happy about, although the moves are basically equivalent. So the two moves that he would consider and the only moves he would consider are knight takes f6 or knight takes c5. Uh, one way wins a pawn. But temporarily, the other way leads to very, very complicated positions that happen in the game. So if knight takes c5, bishop c5 is pretty much forced. dc5, white is temporarily up a pawn with the two bishops. But the bishop on c1 is a very poor piece. And here black has a strong move, bishop to e4. After bishop to e4, uh, black is going to look for compensation in the end game. For example, bishop takes e4, queen takes d1, rook takes d1, knight takes e4. So... Mm -hmm. The advantage for black is that although he's down a pawn, the pawn on c5 is weak. It's very likely to get captured at some point. The bishop on c1 is a very poor piece for the moment, and black has knight to b3 incoming. And the knight on a5, either on b3 or on a5, is an, actually an excellent piece, and it's really jumping around a lot and causing quite a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. So here the computer says that the best way to play for an advantage is with the move c6. And after c6, if knight takes c6, bishop d2 comes, and through this pawn sacrifice, white gets a bit more time play rook c1 to avoid the move knight b3 and basically the pawn b4 can either be a strength or a weakness and in some of these lines after bishop d2 they're turning into a weakness mm -hmm. and the computer gives a small edge for white here mm -hmm. although very small mm -hmm. instead of knight c6 black has a strong move knight to b3 forcing rook to b1 obviously you don't want to put your rook on a2 because then it will never get out of the game mm -hmm. we saw domination themes yesterday we would see domination themes again today yeah uh, rook to b1 now rook to d8 good move and the point of rook d8 is you want to stop bishop d2. If black, if white trades rooks on d8, the rook d8, king d8, the bishop on c1 is stuck there. It's basically a dominated piece. Similar to yesterday, we saw some dominated pieces, and black yes. is doing well. Yes. Instead of rook d8, white has a move knight d4, and then black has a nice accurate move king to e7. Ooh. And king to e7 is preparing rook d6, rook c8, and trying to slowly gather up that pawn on c6. And after a few more moves, for example, f3, knight e c uh, F3, knight, ec5, or c7, rook to d6. Uh -huh. The computer eventually goes into territory saying black has equalized. Yes. Excellent. All right. So knight takes c5, definitely an intriguing move. Probably would have uh, created some problems for... Uh, that being said, for that white point. is very safe in all these lines. Exactly. White, white is really not risking too much. So, Unless the bishop on c1 gets uh, more or less dominated and trapped. Yeah, so it seems to, to get dominated, but only to the point that black has time to capture the pawn on c6. But usually it finds a way to get out anyway because the king can come to e2 and white white can try to organize f3, for example, kicking the knight from e4 and getting the bishop out. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. white usually does not risk in these lines unless unless he'll, he does something very silly. But uh, usually white does not uh, 
have any risk that he's going to get worse here. Got it. All right. Instead, Thing took on F6, but it's not a bad move. It's really not a bad move. Okay. Um, it's just a move that leads to very complicated positions. Here, Jan made an excellent move, GF6. So the reason I think it's excellent, strong computers show both moves as basically, both basically equivalent, queen f6 or gf6. Yes. But queen f6 leads to an initiative for white, and gf6 leads to an initiative for black. Mm. If he had played queen takes f6, white move follows up with the move e4. Mm -hmm. Suddenly bishop g5 is on the horizon. For example, if c takes d4, bishop g5 leads to a very dangerous position for black. Mm -hmm. So black stops bishop g5 with h6. And now... White has a bunch of playable moves. I like the move knight to e5. Uh, knight e5 is preparing f4. And it's saying, okay, capture my pawn on d4. Mm -hmm. And black does. Black mm -hmm. should. And then white plays f4. Mm -hmm. Black plays maybe bishop d6. And white plays a move like bishop to d2. Ooh. And uh, black is on the pawn. But it's one of these typical scenarios where the pawn on d4, it's actually more of a... Um, Pawn that's limiting black's pieces from getting into the game rather Al than a real asset. Al almost a shield for my pieces to hide behind, right? Yeah, it or actually bishop creates an bishop on d3, bishop on d2. Bishop on d3. Yeah. And, and here, uh, if black can't castle because of knight to d7, taking on e5 is very dangerous because you lose the pawn on b4. And so you play a move like queen to e7, but then white can actually play rook to f3 and all sorts of moves. It's a very complicated position. Computer says basically 0, 0, 0, the typical... But a funny evaluation that we see often. Uh, and one thing that one... is going to be very different to what we've seen in the game is that it's going to be extremely difficult for black to cast a long right now. Well, the computer says you can try to do it. Queen e7 followed by cast a long. Mm -hmm. But obviously that comes with its own risks. For example, the a6 pawn is, is rather tender. Yes. And queens with queens on the board, castling long... Um, and without white pieces now have a lot of scope, right? The bishop on d3, bishop on d2, everything is is working very well yeah so i like white's position here even though it's objectively equal mm -hmm. and g takes f6 Jan's decision is an ex excellent practical one because it makes it more difficult for white to play the position yes and it opens up very very nice idea of rook to g8 and suddenly uh, it looks very very scary if you're playing with white pieces because bishop on b7 is super strong rook on g8 is super strong and they're all bearing down on the g2 pawn mm -hmm. so white's king starts to feel a little bit uncomfortable there Okay, I like it. And so Ding's played... first serious mistake of the game was played at this moment after GF6. Very, very serious positional mistake. E4. He played the move uh, E4. It does feel like a natural move for the simple fact that psychologically you've been thinking about getting that bishop from C1 out for a very long time, right? That bishop hasn't had a very uh, happy life up to this point and bishop E3 makes a lot of sense in this position. Um, yeah, you want to get the bishop out. You want to blunt the bishop on b7. From that point of view, it's a very uh, logically, uh, positionally logical move. Yes. But when I see it, I see one thing, and this is what De what uh, Jan played. One problem, which is that you allow the push c4, mm -hmm. and the c4 and b4 pawns, which are supported by the knight on a5, which is an outpost. It's a funny outpost. It's a knight on the rim, but it's still an outpost. These pawns are super dangerous. They restrict white's pieces. They are very dangerous in the end game. They're basically killing white's light squared bishop. Yes. You had you absolutely had to play d takes c5. And if bishop takes c5, now you have time for e4. And the computer gives a tiniest of edges for white here. Instead of bishop c5, the computer says that there's a strong move queen to d7 after dc5. Mm -hmm. And the position is equal, but uh, white is not worse. Black is also not worse. Jan has played very, very well in the opening, and he has a good position. Yes. He has... He will get the c5 pawn back, but first he's trying to play some sort of rook d8 stuff. Yes. Cool. So, so black uh, was doing well, but not better. And yes. then after e4, Jan struck with the move c4. Beautiful. I assume he played yeah. it very quickly. Uh, he spent six minutes on this move, c4. Okay. Relative. There's still something to consider, but I think he understood that this is the right way to go. Probably and they're rather. getting very close on time right now. So Ding, uh, I think his big moment where he spent a lot of time was uh, taking on f6. And uh, compared to the game between himself and Aronian, in that game, he actually took on c5. Let's not forget, instead of the pawn on h3, the rook was, was on e1 in that particular game. He took on f6, spent a lot of time, burned a lot of time, and did not follow it um, properly with this very, very bad move that you just mentioned, e4. E4, so C4, excellent move. The bishop has to go to C2. Obviously, if it goes to E2, you will drop E4 pawn. Mm -hmm. If it goes to B1, you allow knight to B3, which is kind of a disaster for white. Basically, yes. 
Bishop c2 is the only move not to lose at this point. Queen c2, queen c7. Queen c7, good move. There's also a good move, rook g8, but queen c7 stops bishops f4, and it's an excellent move. Mm -hmm. And it's preparing long castle. Mm -hmm. Jan has seen his plan now. He wants to castle long. Mm -hmm. The king the king on the queen side is actually protected by black's phalanx of c4, b4, pawns of the knight on f5. You cannot get to that king very easily. Yep. And then after long castle, black will play rook to g8, and then f5, and start to pressure white on the on the king side. And that's exactly what happened in the next few moves. So bishop to d2. Bishop d2, good move. Rook to g8, good move. Also, long castle was a good move. Rook to c1, uh, not castle. a good, not, not a, a good move. move. Okay. White had to play queen to e1. Basically, you need to disrupt this c4, b4 pawns quickly, and after queen to e1, um, black can play f5, for example, uh, with a complicated position. Black can play queen to b6 with a complicated position, but you really need to get black dealing with that b4 pawn immediately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because first he played the move rook to c1, castle, and here if he plays queen to e1, now f5 comes with a bit more bite to it. Mm. Uh, and the point is you can't capture on f5, and if you capture on b4, take, take, fe4 is rather, well, dangerous is, is putting it mildly. It's basically winning. Uh, uh, e3 is so after f5, next, white, yeah. white can still fight on here um, with a good move like king to h1, but already white is under serious pressure. And if you had played queen e1 the move before, then um, after f5, the rook on a1 could have gone to a better square. It's a subtle difference, but the rook is better on d1 than c1 in those cases. And the king so was still to... stuck in the center at least for one more move. Yeah, why could, why could find a better move than rook c1 before black's king gets castled? And this is a position oh. of tempies. One tempo can change the whole outcome and the whole assessment of the position. It's, yeah. it's a very said... dynamic position. Rook c1 is not a bad move. It just still needs to be followed up with queen e1. Basically, you need to play queen e1 at some point, and after f5, you need to play king h1. And then uh, you're trying to get rid of the pin on the g2 pawn, and you're trying to slowly prepare queen e2. e takes f5, and you're trying to create some sort of uh, like openness because if the position remains closed, black has all the control. You need to open up the pieces so that black's king starts to feel a little bit unsafe itself. Yes. Instead, Ding made a really, really bad move. This is um, this is when it's when his position went from you know maybe not perfectly great but still rather playable to seriously seriously bad. He played the move bishop d3, and I don't really need to explain why this move is bad because we'll see in like two moves. Okay, we'll see exactly why it didn't work out. King to b8, rook king to b8, e1, basically to make some space for bishop yeah, to go get, back to f1. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe the idea of bishop d3 was to pressure c4, but it doesn't really do that because the knight on a5 protects it very well. Maybe the idea was to get it back to f1, but as we see, that didn't work out. So king to b8 is a very good move, logical move, getting the king out of the eye, rook, out of, the eye of the rook on c1. Mm -hmm. Ding played uh, after king b8, rook e1. Basically, if he had tried to take on c4, uh, knight c4, and try to use some tactics to win back the knight, it doesn't work. For example, bishop c4, knight c4, if b3, there's knight to b2 among other moves, but that's a very strong one. Knight to b2. And, yeah, b, take, take b3, knight b2 mm -hmm, basically mm -hmm. keeps the knight, so mm -hmm. white does not get back the material. Yeah. Uh, instead, Ding played rook to e1. Now Jan struck with an excellent move, f5. So the point of f5. There's no more bishop f1. Well, yeah, you stop bishop f1, and also if, if white plays e takes f5, suddenly black strikes with another really strong move, rook takes d4. Whew. And if you take on d4... Oh, rook g2, goodness. king f1. At this point, it's clear that white is getting under strong attack, but there's even a very fast checkmate. Rook takes up. Excuse me. Rook takes up two, king f2, queen h2. <laughs> and let's say you go to e3. You have to go to e3. King f1, queen g2 is a checkmate in one move. Well, king e3, bishop h6 is also a checkmate in one. So. Oh, that's so nice. So that would be a beautiful way to end the game, but of course, uh, Ding would not go for e takes f5. Yeah. Instead, he played bishop to c2, but... Bishop c2, that's that's why I said I don't need to say why bishop d3 was a mistake. This is a ridiculous concession at this point. It's like, actually the first on the computer, bishop c2. Yes. But once you but, play bishop d3, rook e1, bishop c2, you know you're pretty much on the verge of losing. Yeah, you, you just wasted two tempi. There's no other way to put it. Yeah. You played bishop c2, d3, and bishop c2. In the last three moves, you have uh, basically only played one move, which is a move rook to e1. Yeah. So in this highly dynamic position, you can't waste two tempi. Bishop c2, it's already basically on the verge of losing for black. 
uh, for white, sorry. Mm -hmm. And in a number of ways. For example, Jan had an excellent move f6, which is not, maybe not supernatural, but it stops any sort of bishop g5, knight e5. And you also want to go queen g7, right? Maybe someday some queen g7, but in fact, the main idea is to play e5 and just break open uh, everything tactically. So, for example, king h1, e5, and uh, d takes e5, and now queen to g7. And things tactically just don't work out. The yeah. d2 bishop is pinned. White is not in time. Yeah. Instead, Jan played an excellent move as well. F6 was, was nice, but knight c6, which he played, is also a good move. Mm -hmm. Knight c6 threatens, knight takes d4. Simple concept. Not a very natural move, because that knight on a5 did feel quite secure. Uh, also, it felt like it kept the, posi the position very compact, uh, defending that pawn on c4, a very important pawn, a very important phalan of pawns defending the king. Knight to c6, sure. It makes some sense because you're trying to get another attacker. You, you understand that the dynamic has changed. Now you're on the attack, you're on the prowl, and uh, you probably have a winning position due to the fact that your opponent just wasted a couple of moves. So right now it's time to bank everything on a decisive attack, and it feels like that was Nepo's choice. The knight was great on a5, but the knight is going to do an even better job capturing d4. Yeah. So there's only one logical move for white here. It's not the computer's main line, mm -hmm. but other moves look, just look silly because you dropped a d4 pawn. And if you play bishop to e3 to defend it, among other things, black has a move f4, and um, and then you have to go back to d2, and then black has a bunch of like, black is spoiled for choice, including knight takes d4. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Ding plays bishop g5, it's the most logical move. Yeah. And Jan comes up with an excellent exchange sacrifice. Rook, Rook takes g5. g5. On the one hand, that rook was great on g8. On the other hand, it is now going to perform a valuable sacrifice of itself because after rook g5, knight g5, knight takes d4, that knight on d4, the rook on d8, a bishop coming to c5, they're all absolutely um, perfect pieces. Mm -hmm. Black is like, if you look in the dictionary, <laughs> look at the word harmony, you're going to you're going to find this position. <laughs> yes. yes. So... And knight takes d4 wasn't even the only good move. There was also b3 first, but knight takes d4 is an excellent move, and basically you don't really have to to think about it. You play knight d4, and then you ask white, how do you defend this position? I'm threatening bishop c5, I'm threatening queen to f4 at some point, I'm threatening b3. Um, white's pieces are not really performing in the same way that black's pieces are. It, it's just so horrendous. think plays queen h5. Queen h5. queen h5 is to get out of the way of uh, any sort of tactics, like knight to b3 or whatever. Mm-hmm. Jan F6. plays f6. The most accurate way to play was bishop c5. Bishop c5, uh, the computer says, white's completely done. You're, you're toasted. Ah, that's a that's a very nice move, I think, because um, queen takes f7 is met with knight f3, right? Is that the idea? Yeah, so after queen f7, a very strong move is knight f3, g f3, queen g5. Queen king takes one is forced to avoid... Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> what, yeah, queen g3. Uh -huh. I don't What did I say? Queen g5. And yeah, now queen, queen g3. takes g5. After king h1, then you play queen takes g5. Uh, and the attack continues because, um, yeah, white's king and the bishop on c2 is bad. White's king is very weak. Computer says that this is lost, although work remains to be done out here. It's not like super, super simple. Yeah. The best way after queen f7 is actually to move queen to f4. This is even stronger. This is not so spectacular, but it's very simple. g5 is attacked. f2 is eyed. Uh, you have no good way to really defend stuff. Yeah, And no matter what move white plays here, black has a number of good responses, all leading to a winning position. Basically, black's activity is too much to handle. I love it. Yeah. Uh, it's such a beautiful, harmonious position. Yeah. And so bishop c5 was basically crushing. There's also the move knight takes f7 after bishop uh, c5. After knight f7, rook f8, uh, knight to g5 to save the knight. Mm -hmm. Here black has many good ways, but the strongest way is h6. Mm -hmm. Attacking the knight, temporary pawn sacrifice, queen h6, and now queen f4. And the queen on f4 is, as usual, very, very strong, and the knight is pinned on g5, and black is threatening all sorts of things, including, for example, knight to e2, uh, and after rook e2, queen c1, and basically the threats are too numerous. Even though white is up a lot of material, this is this is done. Like, you can't defend this position. You will lose your material very, very quickly with white. Sounds good. And the odd played f6, which is also a good move, but not as good, but still very, very good. <laughs> yes, f6, uh, knight f3. Here, Knight f3, basically knight takes h7 uh, was maybe a better chance, I don't know, but after knight f7, bishop c5 comes, and typical idea is knight takes f6, is met by queen to f4, and white is not saving this position in the same ways that we saw the last position. Yeah. Um, 
Black is threatening b3 to start mm-hmm. with, followed mm-hmm. by knight to c2. Mm-hmm. Uh, black is threatening even slow moves. Uh, and at some point, maybe knight to b3 will come. But basically, f2 cannot be defended in the long term. And the knight on f6 is out of the game. The bishop on c2 is very vulnerable. Black's pieces are too powerful. This game is winning for, for black. Yeah. So instead, he played knight to f3. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't help things at all. Knight takes c2. Rook c2. And now, because the knight is no longer in g5, black has a move bishop d4, which is not even the only good move. But it's a very good one. Yes. Um, here, Ding played probably the last the last chance maybe he could have had to fight on was rook c to c1. And at least you don't lose by force on the spot. Yeah. You lose. Uh, just not on you the spot. You lose slowly, yes. yes. Yeah. Black plays bishop c5, and then black is basically up material at this point. Two, yeah. two pawns and two bishops for a rook and knight, and the bishops are super powerful. The pawns are super compact, and you can't take on c4 because a bishop takes up two stuff. Mm-hmm. And... Um, yeah, black will win in the long term. The only way to defend a, a losing position is to basically try to take it move by move so that you don't collapse immediately. Yeah. With the move rook to d2, Jan made a very simple move bishop to d6, not trading rooks. And then whatever white does next move, c3 is coming. That's the problem with rook d2. Yeah. Now c3 is going to basically push to c2, and that pawn will be too strong. Yeah. He played king h1. Uh, coronation, king h1, c3. c3 came, take, take. Rook d4, otherwise rook d1, c2. I mean, basically that pawn is going to cost white a rook at some point. Yep. Rook d4, c2, queen h6. And now Jan made the final good move. We have to say every move wins for black here, pretty much. Yeah. But the easiest way and the way which forced resignation was e5 because the rook it, has nowhere safe to go to. It just traps the rook. If it goes to d2, which is the only square it can't be captured, then c1 queen will win the other rook. Yes. Wow. And for that reason, after e5, Ding Liren resigned, and that was the first decisive game of the match. Well, Fabi, I have to say, uh, this is just um, a great performance by Jan, but I feel on some degree it was aided by uh, his opponent, by uh, Ding's lackluster performance, at least. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about this last night, and I just read, I think it's uh, Leontos Garcia's article, in El País, and he discussed with both of these players. Jan gave some interesting um, uh, insights about his mindset, but what surprised me the most, it was how Ding and how open he was about his struggles, specifically his psychological uh, struggles going into this event. And he was talking about the fact that, hey, uh, you know, uh, I haven't been the same since 2019. We've discussed about this. We've said that Ding was at his peak in 2019. He noticed that, he recognized that, and he said that I haven't been there. I need, in order to be able to win this match, I need to be able to get back to my former self. I had some heartbreaks in uh, the meantime. Uh, yesterday during the press conference, he says things that um, uh, uh, around uh, along the lines of, hey, I'm depressed, I haven't prepared for this game. You cannot go into this world championship match, into a world championship match, into the eye of the storm with this type of mentality. You're showing too much weakness. Every single thing that you say can be used against you, literally. Uh, and I feel like his mindset is just simply not there. And I thought about it and I came to the conclusion that if he doesn't do something uh, to change the way he's thinking and the way he's behaving, he, by the way, he switched hotels as well. We've heard about that. Um, it, It just feels like he's not in the mental space required to perform at such a high level. What do you think? Yeah. So I I will say from experience that um, COVID and the whole um situation during 2020 2021 and okay less so throughout 2022 but for those two years it definitely had an effect on a lot of people um well obviously it had a pretty much like world changing effect on a lot of people so there is uh it's not just through chess but of course also for chess players it uh it changed the chess world and for many chess players it was a tough struggle and i can speak to that personally and for me, it would be shocking to think that Ding Liren, uh, who who was a very scary player in 2019, he was definitely at his peak, and uh, I was playing him a lot then. He was very scary, and of course, he is still a scary player. Um, but it would be shocking to me if his level did not decrease uh, when he couldn't practice chess in this in the usual way, when he couldn't play tournaments in the usual way, when he had to deal with 
um, probably some some very very difficult situation in China in yes. terms of travel and in terms of dealing with with very strict lockdowns, which um, uh, which definitely maybe they took their mental toll, um, maybe they took their physical toll, but for sure it's not like you you know your your city gets locked down completely and uh, and you just go about your normal life, right? It, it definitely has its has its effects. Yeah. So. So I'm sure that uh, that he, along with many other people, were feeling that effects. Uh, he's been rather candid with his psychological uh, struggles, and you know, when I think of Ding Liren, he's more like I could think of physical struggles because I, I feel like physically he's maybe not at his, uh, not as you know, um, strong as other guys, right? But psychologically, he's always seemed very stable and uh, level-headed, and doesn't uh, doesn't get flustered. Even if tournaments going bad, he usually remains calm and he we saw this in two candidates right he started very badly in both of them but still he kept his cool and he ended well and in, in the last case it ended up being enough to qualify for the world championship match on virtue of being second place so beating nakamura in that super super critical game in the, in the last round yeah um so he has been rather candid but obviously what he says that he's uh you know can't think about chess that he can't prepare that he's uh, that he's feeling emotional and that he's reminiscing and he has all these memories doesn't doesn't sound like an ideal no. condition to play chess in. No. Um, so it's surprising that he's saying that so openly. But um, I don't know. It's still early in the match, but this game is like such a huge blow. I mean, okay, it's only game two of 14, but still this game is so... It was so dominant by Jan. Jan played a perfect game. You cannot fault even a single decision that Jan made. Uh, even if I analyze with a really powerful computer, I just can't. Like I can find moves where he played the second line, so the first he, line. He played really good. He played. He, but he, he played, played an absolutely game. A pristine game, like really a game that you can be proud of. On the other hand, Ding did not. Like yes. Okay, we can we can discuss the move e4. We can discuss discuss the move knight f6. Maybe questionable decisions, but one thing that really sticks out is how can you play bishop d3, rook e1, bishop c2? I mean, like I understand. People lose track of the position. It gets confusing. It's very complicated. You, you, you start with one plan, then you switch plans, and things don't go your way yep. in terms of calculations. But do something in this position. Play king h1. Play queen e2. Uh, there's a lot of moves that don't lead to a losing position. Don't play bishop d3, rook e1, bishop c2. Like, um, although f5 was an excellent move, black had a, an abundance of good moves after bishop d3, king b8, rook e1. Black could have done basically anything. Yeah. And f5 was just like okay the, the best move right yeah um, and then he has to go back and again black has this is more like how you would lose a rapid game or a blitz game yeah. not a uh, high level classical game yeah no so it's 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 thing, a, thing it's was really, really off today. really really off it's a really bad sign he's definitely down but not out yet he still has plenty of time to recover and we will be looking uh to see how he's going and we're anticipating that he will be uh attempting to recover very quickly so um fabi thanks for the rundown of everything that happened in this game that was very insightful as always and um yeah uh, we will be seeing you in the next video cheers guys